Welcome to the Asbestos Knowledge Empire. What does asbestos management mean to you? I used to really struggle with the asbestos management at my site, but now it's a breeze. It used to be really expensive. I was paying loads, but now I've got my asbestos power team in place. It's so much easier. Asbestos can be a pain in the ass if not handled right. We had to stop the job because asbestos was discovered. Now we don't have that problem. Asbestos management is easier than you think. Asbestos management. Be proactive, not reactive. Think about asbestos first, not last. And now your hosts, best-selling authors and asbestos experts, Ian Stone and Neil Munro. Hi, welcome to Asbestos Knowledge Empire. My name's Neil Munro. I'm Ian Stone. Okay, so today, a little bit different, um, I'm going to interview Ian, um, just in and around asbestos, um, so I've got a list of questions that I'm going to talk through, it's going to be a little bit informal, a little bit different, um, and I hope you enjoy it. So, starting with Ian. Hell of an interview. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what you do, and sort of where you're from. Okay, so, obviously. So um, I've been in the asbestos industry for about 17 years, um, started back in 2002 it was. Yeah, long time then. <laughs> Just a bit, yeah. Um, so I started as a, as a trainee, before I got into the industry I had all sorts of different jobs um, over the years, worked in construction, um, directly before I came to the asbestos industry I worked at a solicitors, so again very different to, yeah. to what I now do. Um, but so it was a bit of an office job. Yeah, it was. It was completely desk bound. Um, never left the office nine to five. I mean, I know it's some people's dreams, but yeah. um, I got to the point in my life where that kind of I got bored with that. Yeah, I got fed up with it. Um, doing the same things again and again. Um, you know, the solicitors. Yeah, it was just a bit mundane. So how old were you? Um, I <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was fifty seven then. No. Um, I think I was twenty one, twenty two. Yeah, yeah, twenty two. Right, twenty two when I joined the industry. Okay. Um, so yeah, and I was looking about for, for different jobs that kind of tickled my fancy, and I, I saw a, a trainee asbestos consultant position uh, come up in the local newspaper. Um, and what attracted you to that? It just it was the total opposite to what I was doing at the time. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't desk job. It was out and about. It was. Do you um, remember what the advert said? No, nah, <laughs> nah, It was just. It, it, it was just training position, training asbestos consultant position, and it mentioned about going out on site, doing surveys, uh, the, the scientific tests in there. Um, it kind of it really did it tickle me, and I thought, oh, fancy having a go at that. Um, and well, actually, before I did, six months before. I came to the industry, I, I saw the advert, and uh, the day before I was due to actually go for the job interview, I had a motorbike accident. Uh, okay. Well, say six months, it was a year before. Was it? Yeah, a year before. And uh, so my then girlfriend at the time, I, I got to phone up and say uh, to, to the company, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't come along because I'm in hospital. Right. Um, I, I did a proper job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've fractured bones, uh, I've, I've got plates and pins in my wrist now. Um, so I did, did a really good proper job of a, a motorbike accident. You messed yourself up. I did indeed. Um, hell of a scar on the arm. Um, but yeah, so so that happened. And but I was still kind of conscious that I had this job interview. So um, they rang up. She rang up and sort of said, "Oh, he can't come along because he had this bike accident." And then yeah, about a year later, after I'd fully recovered, I'd gone back to work at the sisters. Yeah. And I was at the same point um, of right, I'm bored with this. Yeah. I'm going to start looking again. And that's when I opened the paper and it was the same job advert. Okay. So um, it was meant to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was meant to be. Contacted them, said, I don't know if you remember me, I was due to come for an interview. Yeah. Uh, they did remember me um, and then got invited into the interview, met the MD, sat down, went through all sorts, had a good conversation about the industry, um, what I can expect, um, the, the overall kind of sentiments behind it. Because before starting, I didn't know anything about asbestos. Yeah. Did you know what asbestos was? Um, oh, oh, I think I, th I was asked that in the inter interview, yeah. and I think my answer was something like, "Well, I don't know much. I know it's a mineral, and I know it kills you." Yeah. And, and, and that was research that you've done for the job, sort of thing, was it? Or did you? No, I, for it? That, that was just kind of a bit of knowledge that I had. I mean, like I said, I worked in construction previous, so yeah, yeah, that's where it come from. But yeah, at the interview, we, we went through the um, bulk analysis and had a look at the the bulks um, okay. in the lab and. Uh, 
you know, colour blindness tests and stuff like that. And right at that point, I was sold. I wanted to be in, involved yeah. with the industry, and yeah, yeah. it sounded really good. Okay. So, w- would you say that um, having a bit of a construction background was was good? Was that do you think that helped? It definitely helped me. Um, I mean, at the so time, it's a requirement that you've got to have that bit of background. I wouldn't say it's a requirement. Um, I mean, some of the guys that work for us don't have that background. However, what I've found over the years is that the people that do have that construction background um, tend to know a little bit more about how buildings are put together. And essentially, when we're surveying for asbestos, you kind of need that knowledge to think, well, is there? Could there be fire battening or fireproofing in this location? That kind of stuff. So it sort of know how buildings are put together. Yeah. It does help a little bit. It does indeed. With fires and stuff. Yeah. I mean, at the time when I joined, there was a lot of people in the industry that um, had come from university backgrounds. Yeah. Environmental science was. Yes. I remember a big one. Everybody had the environmental science degree. Yeah, yeah. And again, I mean, that that helped them in different ways, um, but me not. Coming from a degree background, yeah. um, I didn't need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah university life. Background. University <laughs> life. That's the one. <laughs> cool, cool. So yeah, that's so that's how you kind of got into it. Yeah. And then how has it sort of progressed from that basically going from zero knowledge, pretty much, or yeah, to where I am now. So talk, 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 talk us through that one. I basically, like I say, started as a trainee. Um, started out on site learning analytical first yeah then i went on to surveying um as a follow-on slash kind of involved with the surveying i started learning bulks uh, at the same time and a lot of it i kind of pushed myself to to ask for advice and help and but from the senior guys like can you show me how to do this and once they'd show me how to do bulks i was away and i'd like practice evenings weekends stuff like that yeah just to get on yeah, just to get on really. Because yeah. um, that's that's quite different to the way that companies run today, isn't mm. it? Um, it is massively. I mean, nowadays there's a lot of firms out there that will just train analysts to be analysts and surveyors just to be surveyors. Yeah. Um, and as a business, I, I think of, of getting people out on the ground. It's easier, definitely easier, because you, you've only got to think about um, getting them trained in one subject. So I mean, to, to become a a competent analyst, you're looking at probably six months, and then you can be out and about um, putting pumps out, not very big jobs, not very complicated jobs, probably not doing clearances by then, or if you are doing clearances, really kind of small, easy ones. Yeah. Um, and surveying takes, I mean, anywhere from six to 12 months for, for a similar kind of thing. Um, but then you kind of get pigeonholed in that, and that's not good um, as an overall thing because. Having done everything, and each time I've added another element on, like the pennies drop that little bit more yeah. with the whole thing. So starting off on analytical, like, yeah, you get to see asbestos and you know where it is and all the rest of it, um, and removal and stuff like that. But then when you start surveying, you start looking out for the stuff that you've seen when you've been doing analytical, yeah. and you you look for <coughs> for things I don't know in a bit of with more with an analyst kind of eye. Yeah. So you kind of Start so doing has been removed, and yeah. has been removed correctly. You know where to sort of exactly in those little places. Like a lot of the jobs that we, we did in the early days, and we still do now, are going back and rectifying previous strips, previous removal jobs. Yeah. Um, so that having that analytical eye straight away of right, these are the really tiny fragments that we're looking for. Yeah. When I went into surveying, helped me massively. Yeah, the, the hard bits are to remove. Yes. And the hard bits are like always left over. You know where to look for yeah. it. Exactly, yeah. and then like I say, then I went on to doing bulks as well, and having done the bulks and looking at, at samples a lot more, yeah. um, again, as a surveyor, being on site, it kind of gave me the knowledge and the confidence to look at certain samples and assess and go, do you know what, I really do think this is yeah. asbestos, um, so I am going to do something about it, rather than just sampling stuff. Um, and not knowing. And not knowing, yeah, exactly. It kind of all, all that knowledge kind of went into the pot and just helped each other. Yeah. Um, and then that kind of culminated from doing all that, um, getting my CCP. Yeah. Um, that was that was great uh, early on um, in my career. It was kind of 
nerve wracking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember sitting there having, having the hour long interview. And, Shit, what are they going to ask me? And, <laughs> and, 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 and bastards as well, because yeah. they'd, they'd ask you a question and then you'd, you'd start answering it. And as soon as you get into your flow, thinking, right, I've got this one down, I was about 15 seconds in, they go, right, okay, thanks. Um, yeah. I just want to ask you about something completely different. Yeah. You're like, oh my God, mine was like banging backwards, forwards, all over yeah, the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of cut you down because they know you've got it, sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it was funny at the time, my, uh, my boss went for. Uh, the CCP as well at the same okay. time. Um, yeah. He actually failed, and right. I passed as a trainee. And he'd right. been in the industry a lot yes. longer, um, so I, he was pissed off at that, and obviously was upset by that. But um, I quite like that. And, uh, <laughs> I bet he did. Yeah. I appreciated yeah. that one. <laughs> okay, so so what, so was that the one company that you were at? That yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, kind of later on. Um, I went and helped a, a removal company, a specialist removal company. Right, okay, um, so you went over to yeah, the dark the side. side. <laughs> went to the dark side and the removal side. And how did you find that? Uh, it was good, I enjoyed it. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's different. Again, that knowledge that I learned from doing that process has been invaluable yeah. um, in, in my career. Um, so I helped the company with sort of non-licensed stuff at the beginning, helped them get the one-year licence and three-year licence later on. Yeah. Um, and, and that was that was good. That was good. But I, I'll be honest, I, I I never really enjoyed the removal side as much as the consultancy side. Okay, well, what was that? Really? Um, it, it's just different. Yeah. So you're dealing with different people, different employees. Yeah. Okay. Um, some are harder to manage than others. Sure, sure. Um, so a, a different sort of clientele um, from an employee. Yeah, from an employee point of view. Yeah. Um, but also just like the actual day-to-day -day job yeah. of, um, with, with the asbestos removal, you, it was kind of straightforward. You get given a report, yeah. you look at the report, the client says, I want this gone, or I yeah. want this painted, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, and then you put everything together, so it's all done completely safely. Whereas the consultancy side, um, yes, you've got the information, but then you're, you're, I feel like you're really helping clients kind of steer them in the right direction of yeah. what's good for them yeah. in the here and now but also the forward planning and looking at the, yeah. what's going to be good for them in the future and yeah, then problem solving and planning and exactly. advising and sort of, yeah, talking through their issues and stuff like that yeah that and a, a lot of the stuff is on a bigger scale as well <coughs> I mean we'd have a specialist removal at a site and yes there'd be like multiple sites all over the country but the asbestos um, consultancy side you're looking at stuff like from the global kind of element thinking about the entire country and the 1,000 stores that they had, um, and how this policy that you're putting together with the client, how that's going to affect them overall. And I kind of, I got more of a kick out of that, um, the, the consultancy side. Yeah. So that's why I came back into industry for a little while, but then after that I got bored, okay. <laughs> which I think has been a recurrent theme for me. I always yeah, get yeah. bored. That's why I've enjoyed doing all the different elements. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Was pushing itself through. Yeah, and, and then that's when I, I went to ATAC, um, the Asbestos Testing and Consultancy Association. Okay, so what, what do they do? So, ATAC, I mean, I don't know, some people have heard of ARCA, but not necessarily ATAC. Yeah. So, ATAC and ARCA are one trade association for okay. intents and purposes. Yeah. ARCA is the trade association for asbestos removal contractors, and ATAC is the trade association for consultancies. Okay. And I went to went there as a membership manager, um, and just helped kind of. Up until that point, they'd had a, a I think a part time membership manager. They'd never had a, a full time person in the role to really kind of grab it bull by the horns. Okay. Which was bigger? Was it the removal side was bigger? Yeah, the, yeah. the removal side. The parent company was it? Yeah, exactly. They they're, they're like sister companies yeah. as such within the same um, the same right. arena. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, ARCA was the bigger one. ARCA was the one that first started. Yeah. The removal contractor side was bigger, um, and ATAC had kind of a smaller membership. But because nobody had ever spearheaded doing lots of stuff for the members, yeah, um, it kind of got left by the wayside a little bit. It hadn't grown as much as the removal side. Sure. So like when I started, the um, the removal contractor side, like it had been for years, been doing training for their guys and yeah. the industry guys for years, uh, but the ATAC side had never developed anything like that. Oh right, okay. 
so that was a big thing that I wanted to help with. They'd, they'd started looking into um, what we could do with um, regards to examinations and training courses and things like that. Yeah. And when I was there, um, I was there for three years and I helped develop the uh, Royal Society for Public Health, the RSPH, asbestos qualifications. Right, okay. Um, so, so what was in place before then? So all, all there was when I went to the industry, um, to, the, to the trade association, all there was in the industry was the BOHS qualifications, the yes. P-certs, okay. uh, 401, 402, 403, etc. Um, but uh, again, the, the reason why we kind of looked at it and there was a, a need from my members at the time um, was that the turnaround times for certificates and things like that yeah. was a lot longer than what the industry wanted. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as membership manager, um, I listened to the members and I helped put stuff in place to help yeah. solve that. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I remember, I remember waiting a long time for mm. some white search. You know, it, was, it was often months, wasn't it? As yeah. Opposed to um, what it is now, so I think it's a couple, 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 of couple of weeks. weeks yeah, yeah, a couple of weeks, something like that. So we can thank you. Yeah. For <laughs> that, that improvement. Yeah. 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 Well, it wasn't. It wasn't me alone. I mean, <laughs> no. uh, Dr. Richard Burton, and I worked a lot with him at the RSPH and yeah. the the membership. Um, Exactly. Yeah, exactly. membership managers at ATAC, uh, everybody around the table, Arkans Government Council, everybody kind of, after we started putting it together, everybody came in and could see that the industry wanted it and it needed it, yeah. um, and we kind of all come together to sort the qualifications out, put them together and, and get them out there. So Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's massive really, isn't it? Yeah, no, it was good. I was, I was really proud, really proud of that. Um, yeah, it be. But again, sort of after, after three years, I kind of put those in place and um, when, when I left I think the, the surveying one was in place, the analytical one was in place, the project manager one was in place yeah. and then the next ones on the list was like the, the bulk analysis one which was we'd started to put together but after I'd done kind of three I could see the pattern and how it worked yeah. and put the system in place. Yeah and, and, and again I, I did, I just got a little bit bored and <coughs> kind of wanted to step back out into the industry. Um, yeah, here, here I am now, been at Acorn Ag six years, something like that. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, in a nutshell, my route from. Yeah, yeah. So, and um, what, what, tell us about your, what do you do now then in, at Acorn? Um, so, currently I'm assisting with the operations yeah. department um, and the sales department, helping out just, just essentially running the business, running the guys, uh, making sure that we are hitting our clients' KPIs, making sure that. Um, that the guys have got everything they need to complete everything on site. Yeah, uh, I work quite closely with Paul as well in the um, the technical department to make sure that audits are carried out on our guys regularly. We're, we're again uh, hitting everything that we need to for UCAS yeah. um, and, and just for self assurance that we're, we're doing everything we should be. Cool, nice. So um, obviously. The question that we usually ask our interviewers yes. is, um, <laughs> uh, why, why did you agree to talk about asbestos? But, yeah. um, obviously, <laughs> you've got a, a vested interest in, <laughs> in obviously talking about that. But is there anything you want to sort of add to that? And about, you know, a lot of people, um, our, our viewers, uh, think it's a taboo subject. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if you, you have any thoughts on that. No, I do. I mean, it is it, it is still considered a taboo subject. I mean, yeah. it's kind of, <clears throat> it's a bit of a loaded question. Um, because it is a taboo subject. Yeah. So it is intriguing to find out why the different people that we do interview and the people we chat to have got the opinion that they can speak about it. Yeah. Because from me being in the industry, I know we can speak about it and it's fine. Yeah. Um, it, it's, as long as everyone's got everything in place and people are doing the right thing, it's not an issue. It, it should be treated the same as anything else. Yeah, it's open, open. Yeah, it's an open subject. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been using asbestos in buildings for years. Yeah, asbestos kills you. However, if you've got everything in place and everything's right, um, then it's safe and it's fine. Um, and, and also, kind of, I feel it should be more open, yeah. less of a taboo subject. Because if it was, um, people would be less scared of it. It wouldn't yeah. be as so emotive. Yeah. And more people would be aware. More people would be aware, and also more people would then be proactive about getting stuff yeah. sorted. So, what's the worst thing you've ever seen in regards to asbestos? Can you cast your mind? <laughs> I've seen lots. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, what sort of stands out? The, the one that stands out was a, a school many years ago. Um, I got called out by uh, one of the teachers, rang up, they've been having some asbestos removal works completed, 
and she had some concerns over the contractors and their removal methods and just the kind of general ongoings. Yeah. Um, and it was only down the road from us, so I uh, said, no problem, I'll, I'll pop out. So I met them, um, had a walk around um, the, the site, and instantly I was kind of taken aback. Right. Okay. Kind of from, from the first room that I went to, I was taken aback of what I saw. Um, uh, and there was just kind of how I beat debris, dust, yeah. um, all sorts everywhere. Right. And, uh, I, I, at this point, I didn't know how bad it was. Um, how big was this school? It was it was big. I mean, I don't know how many pupils were there, but it was a big. I think it was secondary school. school. Um, yeah, so probably a thousand pupils, if not wow. more. Um, it was it was a biggie. Mm. Um, were the pupils there? No, the pupils right. weren't there at the time. I think it was summer holidays. Okay. Um, so contractors were in doing work for the quiet time. Thank <coughs> God. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I kind of saw that, and I said, I said to her, I said, well, we've definitely got an issue. Yeah. Let's just have a quick look around. So um, I had a, a quick skirt around a few more rooms, and at that point I was like, right, I've seen enough. Any, anybody that's in this school, uh, we need to get them out. Um, it was just like, there, there was, um, I mean, later on, after after we surveyed it and we identified everything, um, there was asbestos in the skip outside that had been dragged. Um, some asbestos insulating board had been um, cut with a skill saw. Um, and there was just, it looked like talcum powder on the floor. It was that kind of yeah, sword. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and essentially, throughout the school, it was like that. Wow. Um, yeah, that's a massive, massive disturbance. And uh, huge. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the guys that um, yeah, the guys that were completing those works would have got big um, exposures. Big exposures, definitely. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, that, that, was, that's, that was crazy. That was the worst. So what happened with that? Do you know? Or yeah, um, we were involved. Um, with the, the kind of the clean up and the clean up operation and getting it all back to back to working. I mean it was sort of extended that to go to look. A lot of a lot of things had to be disposed of. Yeah. yeah, decontamination. I mean essentially the, the school was turned into an asbestos enclosure. Well, Negative pressure units put on the back of the school, yeah. airlocks and bag locks put on the front of the school, and then the school was cleaned. Right. So I mean there, there was all sorts that went on. Um, kids coursework, because kids coursework for the A levels were coming up. That had to be photocopied and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it was just it was crackers. The amount of stuff we had to do, and the things we had to get rid of. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, so if I could ask you, what's the strangest asbestos you've ever seen? Bit of a random question. It is. It is. What's um, the strangest one. Or odd. Uh, or sort of stands out. I don't know. I mean, the things I've seen it used in all sorts of places. Have you? Yeah. Um, and it just baffles me. I mean, the simple one, ARB packers and the window sills. Yeah. That's baffled me for years. <laughs> okay. Chippies. Why, why bother? Yeah, chippies. The, it's their doing? job to use wood, and they put a wooden window sill in. They then pack it out with a special insulating board. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, it was like it done again and again and again. Yeah. And it was yeah. like as if that became the norm, and that was the product to you. Oh, I don't yeah, know. Definitely. Yeah, it's count countless asbestos surveys that I've, I've carried out, and um, one of the things is the, expect, the unexpected, and, and yeah. the packers and stuff like that are always yeah. unexpected, and it's really hard to find those ones, isn't it? It and is. You know, yeah. It could be under one window seal, couldn't yeah. it, as opposed to all of them. Again, on uh, floor joists, I've seen it. So you've yes. got big timber floor joists. Yeah. yeah. The, the one end's been packed out with asbestos insulating board. Yeah. Um, I don't know why they didn't just use a bit of wood. <laughs> like, because it was the product that they were using. Yeah. Um, so at the time, I suppose it was a good idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A bit lying about, I suppose they had some on the door or whatever. And yeah, yeah. Chopped it off. Um, but yeah, just stuff like that generally. I've, it's always perplexed me of yeah. how we got to that point of view. Right. Okay. Cool. So what? Um, what's the best? I say asbestos thing, but what what sort of stands out? If you look over your career, what what sort of stands out as a moment where you think, you know what, that was a good moment. That was either you know getting that in place was mm. a good thing, or um, yeah, what sort of stands out as a good thing? I've got one. Yeah, I've got one. Um, so there was a client that we were working with a couple of years ago, and they they had sprayed asbestos on their beams. Um, so when you first get the call, uh, can you come and just see if what we're doing is all right and all the rest of it? Yeah, what, what's the run now? And they say you've got sprayed asbestos. It's like, oh my word, like, what, what am I going to find? Yeah. 
And I went along, and they kind of, they just invited me in as a bit of a health check, really, you know, of what they were doing. Um, went to have a look, looked through the documentation, went and had a look at the beams, um, and what they'd done on the beams was fantastic. Uh, they were up on like these high-level grids because uh, people needed to work up and around it. But what they'd done, instead of just encapsulating it with uh, like wrapping it in cloth and then encapsulating it with ET150, yeah. um, they'd also overclad them um, with like <coughs> next level industrial metal. Yeah. Um, and all, all the joints were riveted. Wow. Um, yeah, it that was impressive. Been expensive. It must have been expensive. Yeah. Um, exactly. And I mean, just to see that, they'd obviously taken on board the risk from the asbestos spray on the beams. Yeah. And they went all out to make sure that it was safe. Yeah, yeah. Um, which was fantastic. Wow, so do you think it would have been more expensive to remove it then? Because that sounds really expensive to yeah. me. Um, um, yeah, I, th I think it probably would have. Yeah. Um, but because of, generally, for stuff like that, when we remove some asbestos, something's got to be put back in its place, of course. Um, and I, I think that's why they, they perhaps took that view of, right, well, it's here, it's doing its job, it's, it's okay, Yeah. Um, but let's just make it safe um, for us to work in and around it. So, the Asbestos and Large Empire, um, the, the question that kind of sums up the theme of the, the, the actual podcast is um, a question, so what does Asbestos Management mean to you? So, Asbestos Management to me, it's life or death. Okay. Th th that's what it comes down to as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, it's, if asbestos isn't managed properly, then people die from it. People have been dying for years, oh, I've met quite a few people that have died yeah. from asbestos diseases and it didn't need to happen and it doesn't need to happen and that's the long and short of it for me if asbestos is managed properly then we, we can have it in our buildings and we can be safe around it and yeah. treat it um, properly and, and, and that's what I just wish more people would understand um, about asbestos management is that it's not a taboo subject yeah. it can be something that we fix and work on together not ignored or <laughs> exactly that yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. And, and, and is, is it a ball ache Oof. It, it's it's more of a ball ache if you Not don't to. do anything yeah um, definitely and, and that's what we find day to day if a client comes to us and says oh, mate, I've got this project coming up can you help me with it that it all kind of slots in and everything follows on and follows suit all nicely yeah so we thought of uh, the money for the budget has been put together what I find is the issue when people come to you on the last minute and say I've got a project starting next week, can we have a survey? Or even worse than that, we started a project, we think we've discovered asbestos. Yeah, because that's when it really goes wrong sometimes. Definitely. It does, that's the worst end of the scale. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. So is there anything that you would change um, regards to asbestos management, regulation, or just industry as a, as a whole? For, for kind of, sort of like things that bug you about it and that you wish that you could sort out so regulation wise yeah um it, we've got everything in place like in there is our what we can work to yeah um it's the actual implementation of those regs and checking people are actually complying with those regulations yeah like reg 4 came out 2002 yeah. um implemented in 2004 and yeah as a business now in 2019 we're doing Asbestos management surveys for businesses that have never heard about asbestos, yeah. never heard of the regulations or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's one thing. I mean, HC did do a hidden killer campaign, which yeah. I'm sure has helped countless lives. Yeah, that was kind of focused at more trades. It was, trades, yeah. Wasn't it it was, not the actual duty management. Yeah. Um, so I think a big push on that side would would help everyone yeah. in the long run, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and as an industry, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, I'm probably saying it because that's the route I went down, but I kind of wish the, the industry as a whole stayed with the everybody should be a consultant. Yes. A fully rounded consultant out there in the field yeah. rather than a going down the single route analyst, surveyor um, kind of thing because, like I said, I, I feel that being fully rounded, you, your knowledge is better, so that yeah, only gives absolutely. clients better information. Yeah. yeah, so do you think that... Um, that if you haven't had that rounded education yeah. experience, that you're doing less quality. Definitely, hundred percent. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you would do. 
job to be asked to do. The, the, the job that you're asked and the job that you're trained for, but it's about the bigger picture sometimes. Yeah. And you only get that if you have done the other elements. I, I do feel the industry has been watered down a little bit yeah. by cheap. Cheap, yeah. yeah cheap. Exactly. Oh, well, if it's cheaper if we only get analysts in, yeah. it's cheaper if we only do this. <coughs> but you get what you pay for at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah, it is longer and it is a harder route to use people um, and get people trained to the appropriate level as employees. I mean, we take time and effort. Some of our guys have said, no, I only want to be a surveyor, Yeah, which is fine. But then we've kind of tried to give them more um, more knowledge and information as well because we, we have put them through the duty holders courses and stuff like that. Yeah. So even if they don't want to get involved in the analytical side, we've at least opened their eyes. Expanded their knowledge. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think as an industry overall, that that's where we've kind of gone wrong. It, it feels like it's been watered down um, quite a lot for me. Yeah. Cool. Nice one. So final question. Yeah. <laughs> what's your one bit of advice you'd give anyone with regards to asbestos? What's that? What's that golden nugget that you would say to anyone um, about asbestos? Well, I mean, to coin our own phrase, uh, asbestos first, not last. That's kind of the biggie. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that, in the, in its most basic form, is get a survey done. Yeah. No matter what you're having done, whether it, you're in your building and using it day to day, get a yeah. survey done. If you're going to be doing the refurb work, get a survey done. Yeah. Because that's kind of the starting point to get the knowledge together to then do something about the asbestos. Because without knowing it's there, you, you can't do, deal with it, you can't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. I think if you always did, you know, if you took that, is it anything you do within any building, any property, uh, anywhere, if you thought about asbestos first, it would solve so many problems or stop so many issues happening, wouldn't it? Definitely, definitely, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. Have you enjoyed your interview? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did, that was alright, that was good. Good, good, good. Okay, well, that's it for us. Um,